Infosec AU on Twitter, so feel free to reach out to me after you've uh, watched this presentation and you have anything you want to talk about regarding enterprise application software security. Um, so I'll just move on with the talk, and uh, the first thing I want to go through today is how we actually obtain the source code. When you look at enterprise web applications, one of the biggest things about them is there's a lot of security through obscurity. The fact that you simply cannot obtain the source code is often a really good defense mechanism for not finding vulnerabilities within it. So one of the things that is uh, something that you have to be really good at is being able to get your hands on this software and analyzing the source code from that point onwards. I'm going to be going through some of the common techniques that I've used over the last couple of years to be able to discover source, to, to be able to obtain the source code for these enterprise applications. The first technique I'm going to be going through today is obtaining the source code through cloud marketplaces. So if you're not familiar with cloud marketplaces, um, we have many vendors list their software on these cloud marketplaces on AWS, Azure, and GCP. In many cases, you're able to obtain a trial license that lets you access the software that's most likely typically gated through an enterprise sales process. I think not many people enjoy talking to salespeople, so this is a great way to get access to the software. Um, this is really valuable because we can pretty much spin up enterprise software from these marketplaces, and you are able to get access to source code in many different ways by either dumping the disk or uh, getting a shell access once you've spun it up. I've used this uh, technique multiple times in order to gain access to source code I typically wouldn't be able to get. So here's an example. This is on AWS Marketplace. One day, I came across this asset uh, running on FB.com, which is Facebook. And it was running something called PCO IP Connection Manager. Looking on Google and doing a little bit of sleuthing, I found that it was actually the software called Teradisi PCO IP Connection Manager. And thankfully, it was available on a cloud marketplace. I was able to spin up this software from the cloud marketplace, obtain the source code, and then find vulnerabilities within it. So this is just an example, but there's many enterprise software on these cloud marketplaces. And it's something that you should check first off before you give up on auditing enterprise software. The second technique that I want to go through today is container image registries. Uh, so this uh, really includes Docker Hub for the most part. So if you just go to hub.docker.com, you can search for any of the images that have been put up on Docker Hub. Um, if an image is available, you can simply spin up that Docker container, and then you can gain shell access to the container and then obtain all the source code, whether that's WAR files, JAR files, PHP files, whatever, for further analysis. This is similar to cloud marketplaces, but you're most likely running random images that people have built uh, on the internet. But this is also a very successful methodology when it comes to obtaining software. So you can see here, uh, you can obtain Adobe Experience Cloud either by contacting sales or relying on a Docker image that's already been built and pushed to Docker Hub. So you're, you're, it's much easier to find this software pre-built and you can even see here that it was updated two months ago. So it's not as if it's outdated, and it's most likely still uh, current enough for you to perform your security analysis. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of enterprise software on Docker Hub, sometimes posted inadvertently. And sometimes um, it's not intentional, but it's great for us security researchers so we can get access to the source code. Uh, the third technique is obviously contacting sales. Um, I mean, these enterprise software um, companies have big sales teams, and um, this is a high friction, high reward technique. Um, if the only possible way uh, is to contact sales to get a copy of the software, you better believe that that software hasn't had many eyes looking at it from a security perspective. Um, while this is often the highest friction, if you can convince sales to give you a trial copy, it's quite likely you're going to own the crap out of it. And this is my least favorite route, because boo, who wants to talk to sales? But historically speaking, it's had the highest rewards for me personally when it comes to finding critical vulnerabilities. Uh, another technique is uh, freelancing websites. So this is a little bit more creative. Um, I'm sure a lot of you would have heard of sites like Fiverr, 
Um, so if you find experts in the certain software you're auditing on these freelancing websites, you can convince them to give you a copy of the source code. Um, so this is an example of me trying to get a copy of WebSphere Commerce, which is a very obscure but still quite popular software deployed. Um, and I just asked someone on Fiverr who specializes in deployments of WebSphere. Um, so this is another technique that you can use to gain access to source code. This has been successful for me in the past, especially when there's really no other way to get it. Um, obviously, another technique is GitHub. Um, so you can just use GitHub docs to try and identify whether or not someone has put up this software on GitHub and then obtain the co a copy of all that software. Um, so for example, if you're using the enterprise web application and you see install CMS step one, you could chuck that in as a file name and see if that's available somewhere on GitHub. This can be really effective for .NET or Java code bases by searching the correct strings on GitHub. And lastly, the technique I want to go through, um, which, uh, you know, depending on the situation can be very valuable, is chaining vulnerabilities. Um, so you can, you can often leverage other vulnerabilities to obtain source code for applications. Challenges often include not knowing all the file locations and potentially not allowed, depending if it's a bug bounty program or a specific vendor you're targeting. But one of the more common techniques with vulnerabilities is if you have local file disclosure, you can leverage that local file disclosure to disclose the source code uh, as long as you know the location of the source code. Um, uh, another one is XXE, which is external entity injection. That can also lead to local file disclosure and also can lead to source code disclosure. Obviously, command execution will let you read the source code. Um, but yeah, uh, on .NET systems, you can often download the DLL files from the bin folder and decompile them back to C-sharp source code. Um, so this is something that uh, I've also historically used when it comes to obtaining access to enterprise application source code. Um, often on .NET environments using some sort of local file disclosure vulnerability to download all the DLL files in the bin folder. So one of the things that um, I just want to preface this, uh, the rest of the presentation with is I just want to have a little bit of a reality check for what people think security research is like and what it actually is like. So what people think security research is like is something like this. Um, they think it's magical, you're going to find amazing vulnerabilities all the time, you're going to be the zero-day master, it's going to be a lot of fun, there's no hard moments. But in reality, what security research is actually like is you first have hope, you find no bugs, you maybe find a bug, the bug was a fake, the understanding leads to a real bug, and the bug isn't reachable on default config. So in many scenarios, this whole journey and adventure of finding zero days in enterprise applications you often only see the end result, which is you know, a command execution vulnerability or a local file disclosure or whatever, but you don't see the process. And the process is painful. It's something that you need to have a lot of endurance for, and you need to be committed to finding these vulnerabilities. You cannot give up easily, otherwise you will not find them in many scenarios. So now I'm going to go through a bunch of enterprise products, which uh, I've found vulnerabilities in over the last year. And this is going to go through some of the successes, some of the failures, what I learned along the way, some of the lessons. Um, but essentially, we're starting off with a product called IBM WebSphere Portal. It's now rebranded to something called HCL Digital Experience. But you, know, you might be wondering what this software actually is. So it's an enterprise content management system. It's used by medium to large enterprises. There's around 4,500 instances on the internet. And it's often self-hosted. Uh, which is great because we get to target infrastructure belonging to organizations around the world. It has widespread use amongst the Fortune 500 and companies that run bug bounties. So it was a great target for us. So the way we got started is we just pulled down a Docker image. Um, you know, Earlier in this presentation, I was talking about all the different techniques to get access to the source code. Fortunately, for WebSphere Portal, there was the, the ability to just pull the software from Docker Hub and we were able to start up a WebSphere portal server. So quite simple. Once we started the Docker server, uh, the Docker container, we found all the jar files, put them in a tar file, and then extracted it, and then decompiled all of it. So these were the commands that I used. I used the Procyon decompiler to get all of the Java source code. The next step 
uh, usually that I take when I look at any enterprise web application is understanding the attack surface. Uh, this is one of the most important steps because this will then lead to the rest of your discoveries. And if you do a poor job at this step, then you might miss a lot of really important vulnerabilities. So in this scenario, it was quite simple. Uh, we just used a grep command to look for anything that had servlet mapping or mapping. Now again, like this does require some inti uh, intimate knowledge about how this application works. But over time, you do become familiar with how different applications are deployed, whether it's on Tomcat, whether it's on some PHP web server or some Python application. They all have different patterns for deployment. In this scenario, um, this was on a WebSphere server, but it was very similar to Tomcat, where you could look at all the servlet mappings and mappings which are typically inside XML files, and then understand the attack surface. So we see here there's a lot of matches, and uh, there's a lot of attack surface to go through. But in our process of doing this, we ended up finding this file called proxy-config.xml. And you can see here that it actually has multiple paths that let you proxy to these three URLs. You can either proxy to www.ibm.com, www-03, or redbooks.ibm.com. Now, this was quite surprising, because uh, if you're not familiar with uh, the vulnerability class of server-side request forgery, um, that's something that can be quite critical uh, on, on, these, on these networks. And this vulnerability, this potential vulnerability, uh, leads to this potential code leads to server-side request forgery. Um, it's interesting that they've allowed you to access these three websites. And uh, it's something that uh, really caught our attention. And we wanted to see whether or not we could leverage these three whitelisted websites to actually access any website we wanted through this server-side request forgery. For those that don't know what server-side request forgery is, it is essentially when you can coerce a web server to make a request on its behalf, and then you can uh, read the contents of any web request that you make on behalf of the server. So if this server is on a sensitive internal network, through server-side request forgery, you can actually access all the internal IPs and hosts and different things on that sensitive internal network. That's why something like this is potentially uh, critical. So one of the things with enterprise web applications and, and, and auditing them is, yes, we can see the mappings and the code, but sometimes it's quite tricky to understand where the endpoints are on the application. In this scenario, it wasn't too bad. Uh, everything was under the path of slash WPS. So we can see in the previous slide, we had proxy, my proxy, common proxy, but that's all now just mapped at slash WPS slash. Um, but you know, the config file just said that we could access ibm.com and redbooks.ibm.com. How are we going to turn this into a full read SSRF? How are we going to be able to access any host that we want to? Well, what we did was we chained a Lotus Domino open redirect. This website, redbooks.ibm.com, runs Lotus Domino to deliver content to users. So if we were able to achieve a URL redirect on this website, then we would be able to achieve SSRF on any arbitrary host. And after researching Lotus Domino, I noticed some really old documentation around the sign-out process. Um, basically, it let you be redirected anywhere you wanted to. So this was the documentation. And in the documentation, it said, if you append at and redirect to, you can redirect to any location. Um, so this was exactly what we were looking for. And what we were able to do is, uh, if you went to this URL and you slapped on the end, question mark, log out, and redirect to, the server would respond with a 302 found with a location header of example.com, which we want to redirect to. This is perfect for our use case. Because what we can do is we can combine all these elements together and achieve a full read SSRF. So this is what the final payload looked like. Um, WPS proxy, and then redbooks.ibm.com, and then you've got the redirect. And you can see that the web server is rendering example.com, uh, and that request is happening on, the, on behalf of the web server. Um, so this is you know, a full read SSRF in IBM WebSphere. And this is pre-authentication. One of the things that you often do when auditing enterprise software is you go variant hunting. And what I mean by that is once you've discovered one vulnerability and one pattern, 
you try and find that vulnerability and pattern across the entire code base and see where else it's occurring, because likely if the developers have made a mistake in one location, it might be repeated in multiple other locations. So when it comes to variant hunting for this vulnerability, we looked for all the files that were called proxy-config.xml. We found a number of them, and actually these two in particular that are highlighted in yellow were extremely problematic. So the first one was essentially a proxy to any URL with the ability to use any of these methods. So get, head, post, put, delete, which is kind of like a super proxy um, and quite dangerous. Um, and it also let you use all of these headers as well. So it would proxy all these headers as well with the full response returned. So just by doing this exercise of variant hunting, we're able to discover an even more critical vulnerability that had the same pattern as the first vulnerability we discovered in this code base. So this is what it looked like, basically full read SSRF as well. I know that it, it doesn't look that exciting with example.com being loaded here, but just imagine if it was your internal Confluence wiki or something like that. So with variant hunting, there was, a lot, there was actually a lot more variants, um, some that were quite complicated that you wouldn't be able to protect by just putting a WAF in place. Um, so you can see the one with content handler with the digest. Um, it was quite complicated to protect against this vulnerability by just using some sort of WAF rule. Um, in this one, you had to use the open redirect as well. And this is what it looked like. And we also had more variants in the Ajax proxy and the proxy servlet. Um, just quickly running through these, it's the same sort of impact, uh, and you're able to achieve server-side request forgery, pre-authentication through these endpoints as well. Um, now, we found server-side request forgery, but uh, you know, we, as good hackers, we don't want to stop there. We, we, we think to ourselves, how can we escalate this? How can we make this more critical? It's great to have server-side request forgery, but re remote command execution is even better. And uh, initially, we thought with this server-side request forgery, we could uh, somehow access an internal port and exploit other functionality inside these internal uh, services running on this web server. So we found something called IBM KC, uh, which is IBM Knowledge Center. And that was accessible on port 9043. And the web.xml file had this little snippet, which uh, basically was slash API slash web feed. Um, now, just to be frank, this is a vulnerability uh, that I'm going through, the one that I'm going through now. We were ultimately not successful with it. But I'm sharing this information just because to walk you through the process that we went through and the effort we had to go through before realizing it wasn't possible. And I think that's a valuable part of the learning process. So we download the kc.war file uh, from our Docker image. And we find that it's got this path, which is slash web feed. And it seems to take in a URL and uh, do something with it. It seems to parse it in some way or form as it's an RSS web feed URL. If we take a look at the parsing logic, we can see in the parsing logic it's got the XML stream reader with create reader in. And it seemed like this XML stream reader had no protections against external entity injection. So this was a very viable technique for us if we were able to leverage our SSRF into something more serious. And unfortunately, we tried on a bug bounty target, and it fails. It returns forbidden. And at this point, we're not sure what we've done wrong. Uh, we think that we've got the correct endpoint, we're proxying to the correct port, and we are trying to provide it a URL, but it's not working. So we start digging a little bit further, and we realize that we had an older version of WebSphere Portal, because uh, that's all we could get at the time. And uh, we realized that with a newer version of WebSphere Portal, uh, that request was forbidden. So obviously, we, we grab the, the war file, we take a look at the uh, source code, and it's been deprecated, which really sucked, because uh, we spent a lot of time going through WebSphere source code before we found that this was deprecated and not working on the latest versions. We also had some more attempts at XXE, uh, and unfortunately, we weren't successful with these either. Uh, we tried uh, encoding some uh, XML entity injection payloads and uh, chucking them into the resource proxy, which took base64 XML. Um, and unfortunately, it responded with something along the lines of 
um, you know, the entity could not be resolved. Uh, we dig further into the code, and we realize that the uh, entity handlers have been nulled out. So it's not possible to actually resolve any entities as a part of this endpoint. But again, this is another failure in the process of finding vulnerabilities in WebSphere. I think it's quite valuable to talk about. There was another vulnerability in WebSphere Portal, which uh, allowed you to uh, get post-auth command execution via directory traversal. So once you were authenticated, you were able to upload a zip file that contained HTML, CSS, or JavaScript. The extraction of this zip file uh, was vulnerable to directory traversal. So once you went to a specific location inside WebSphere Portal, you had the option to import a zip file that was vulnerable to directory traversal, but you could only upload HTML files or JS or CSS files. And you might be thinking to yourself, how can I make that impactful? That doesn't sound that important. Well, actually, uh, if you're able to upload um, files to the local system at any location, if you upload a file to the etc sysconfig network scripts location, regardless of the extension that that file has, on reboot, it will execute the command that you have in the file. Um, this is uh, uh, quite an interesting technique. It only works on some distributions. However, this is something that you could use to get post-auth post RCE on WebSphere. There's a tool called Evil Arc, which lets you craft zip files which have directory traversal. And you could very easily use this tool to craft a, the, 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 the malicious file. You can see the command in this slide here of how I did that. You might be wondering, why does this work? Well, there is this uh, amazing full disclosure um, uh, uh, mailing list which has this message about this guy who came across this. For whatever reason, if you're able to f uh, write a file which uh, starts with IFCF into that specific folder, uh, then you can execute whatever command is inside the name attribute on restart. Um, there's some references here, but I'll be sharing my slides after this talk, so don't worry about getting any of these down. Um, there is an exploit write-up as well uh, for this uh, that goes into a lot more detail about how we found these vulnerabilities, what they are, and if you're interested in understanding them a bit deeper. The next enterprise technology that I want to go through is SolarWinds Web Help Desk. Uh, SolarWinds Web Help Desk is a a uh, central ticket ma management system for your enterprise. It connects with SolarWinds Orion. It's used by medium to large enterprises, schools, and government. There's around 2,000 instances exposed to the external internet. Um, one of the lessons that I learned along the way was you know, removing the stigma from huge code bases. Um, it's used by large enterprises, but their code base is just huge. There's Spring, web objects, traditional servlets. It's extremely complex. And it can be really daunting looking at this software uh, just as someone who's never had experience with these technologies or someone that you know, may not understand how everything works. But with some intelligent analysis of the sources and sinks, it starts to get easier. Um, my number one advice when it comes to auditing complex software is try and map out as much of the attack surface as possible in the form of sources and sinks, and then do your auditing after you understand this. Um, the first thing we came across in Solovin's web help desk was this hard-coded credential for something called the help desk integration user. Um, this was interesting, so we searched this credential in the code base in order to find the production hard-coded credentials, um, which was even more interesting. Initially, our, our, our questions were, what do these credentials let us do? Why are these credentials hard-coded? That does not look good. Um, so these credentials let us access a big part of the Spring Web App embedded in this software. The most interesting controller was found in the Asset Report controller. And surprisingly, SolarWinds were exposing endpoints that let you uh, run arbitrary Hibernate queries uh, and view any of the SQL output that came back from the database. Hibernate talks directly to the database based off the models explicitly defined in Java. So this was the code. The code was essentially uh, an endpoint called slash raw HQL. Uh, and this let you provide a Hibernate query and uh, give you the result of the Hibernate query. We needed those hard-coded credentials to reach this endpoint. So that was an important discovery. If we take a look at the get string HQL result, you can see that it's literally just taking the HQL query and uh, creating a query and returning the result. So very simple. 
So you needed a few things in order to exploit this. You needed a CSRF token. You needed the hard-coded credentials in basic auth format. Uh, and again, the CSRF token in the cookie. The content type must be text plain. And then your Hibernate query inside the post request. So if you had all of these elements, which you can obtain pre-authentication, you were able to run basically any SQL query on SolarWinds Web Help Desk and receive the full response. So that, that returned the, the email and the password in, in a hashed format, which is pretty crazy that you can do this without any authentication. Um, what's not shown in this presentation is the hours that were spent mapping the sources and sinks and understanding the authentication flow in some of these spring routes, numerous failed attempts at exploiting certain vulnerability classes, the vast amount of code uh, in this code base causing auditing fatigue, and obviously shouting F yeah once you've discovered a pretty auth critical bug, which is the best part of the journey. The impact is you can run arbitrary SQL queries uh, against SolarWinds Web Help, Help Desk's internal database. This allows attackers to obtain the username and password hash from the database. Um, it's limited to Hibernate queries, but it's still quite critical because you could still like, insert users or modify data within SolarWinds Web Help Desk. You can find the exploit right up here. Um, again, I will be sharing slides, so you will be able to click through this in the future. The next product I want to go through is hacking Sitecore's experience platform. Um, so Sitecore is a very comprehensive CMS that's used by large enterprises, governments, banks, Fortune 500 companies. You can build a lot of digital experiences through this. There's around 10,000 instances of this software running on the internet, and a handful of bug bounty programs were discovered uh, were, were vulnerable when uh, using this software. Um, one of the notes as well with source code auditing is uh, many times when you're doing source code auditing, you want to give up because of how daunting it is or because you know, how hard it can seem when you're going through it. And throughout my journey of auditing Sitecore, I wanted to give up like five times. It was so tempting to like just walk away and not spend any more time auditing this software. You've got to be really motivated, but there's also some really good advice here of just taking a lot of breaks. If you get fatigue while looking at source code, my advice is just step away from the computer and come back when you feel better. And if you do this consistently and you're persistent, you will be able to find zero days uh, in a reliable, consistent manner as well. So I obtained the source code of Sitecore from a GitHub repository, uh, and I obtained uh, two important elements, the web root of Sitecore and also the source code after decompiling all the DLL files. This was really important because there was attack surface in both areas that you needed to map together. This is something that's uh, specific in many cases to .NET applications, where you've got all the c -sharp source code, but you've also got files in the web root that map to the c -sharp source code. So when we're mapping out the attack surface, we were able to look at the .config files located in one of the folders and understand what the mapping looked like. Uh, there's a bunch of ASPX and ASHX files, but you can see that inside the web.config file, there's this line which is saying slash sitecore slash shell maps to the physical folder slash sitecore slash shell. So this was uh, an important thing to notice because this led to our discoveries in, later on. So since we have the sitecore shell directory, we can see that there's all these different files in there. There's like these ASHX files, ASPX files, but the journey in mapping the attack surface is not over yet. We're still not sure what's pre-authentication or post-authentication. So we need to go through each one of these files and read the source code in order to understand what are the authentication requirements, if there are any authentication requirements. Um, when we investigated some of the files, we found this one particular file called report.ashx, which had this code here, which essentially said this is where the C-sharp code is. And we loaded this source code in our ID to try and understand what this file let us do and if it required authentication. Um, this might be a little bit hard to read, but in this file, uh, you can see that there is a, uh, it is taking in a HTTP request. Uh, it is taking in the post body, and it is uh, going to the sync report data serializer dot deserialize query. You will also notice in this file that there is no authentication required before it goes to the sync of deserialized query. So this is very interesting. And anytime you see any software mentioning uh, anything about deserialization, 
that should definitely get you very curious about how that deserialization works, because in most languages, deserialization can be quite dangerous. It can most likely lead to something like command execution. Once we look at report data serializer.cs, we can see that there is this sync uh, deserialized parameters where the post input ends up at net data contract serializer.read object. Now, for those that aren't aware about .NET security, in .NET, there are a number of ways of deserializing data, and many of those ways are quite dangerous. Net data contract serializer is actually a very dangerous way of deserializing data uh, because it can lead to command execution. So what we found is from source to sync, um, the ability to potentially get command execution. So to craft the payload here, we used some software called YSOSerial.net. Um, you can basically generate uh, a gadget which will uh, execute an arbitrary command, and we slot it into this XML that we have crafted to end up at that sync. Uh, once we've done that, we can literally just send the post request to report.ashx with our XML payload, and we have command execution, which is very critical. This is pre-authentication, and it affects a large number of Sitecore versions. There are a lot of governments that use Sitecore, a lot of enterprises, a lot of Fortune 500. So this bug was very critical and affected a lot of organizations. It's something that um, I think was probably in the code base for three or four years before it was discovered. So this is something where, you know, just the idea of enterprise web applications um, uh, having vulnerabilities, you know, but not being found through obscurity is very much so the cases here, just because no one had, had looked through this before. The exploit write-up for this can be found here. Um, and yeah, there's a, a bunch of information about how we did uh, the whole thought process behind this one. Um, the last product that I want to go through today is VMware Workspace ONE UEM which is AirWatch. Um, this, this product is uh, used for mobile, uh, mobile device management. It's actually extremely popular. Um, it used to be called AirWatch. Now it's called Workspace ONE UEM as it's owned by VMware. But one of the interesting things about MDM solutions is they need to be exposed to the external internet for many reasons. Mobiles need to be able to contact these MDM solutions in order to be able to operate in general. So almost every large enterprise has some sort of mobile device management solution. Um, and this was one that we targeted uh, at Asset Note. Um, installing uh, this software was actually harder than discovering the vulnerability, which is in many cases what happens with complex enterprise software. I think we spent around a week just trying to install the software. That was before we even looked at any of the source code. Um, on the right, I've got a structure of directories that were uh, obtained from uh, the AirWatch installation. And you can see that these uh, directories uh, are just all deployed under different paths, like slash catalog or slash AirWatch. Um, there, was a presence, there was the presence of some ASHX files, which we focused on when initially looking at the attack surface. Some of these ASHX files were not protected by authentication. We found this one file called blobhandler.ashx. And this file existed under multiple virtual paths, but this endpoint was accessible pre-authentication, and there was no authentication logic within the code. But you can see here in this piece of code, uh, it's a function called render proxy response. And I know earlier in this presentation, we talked about SSRF and the dangers of SSRF. But this is another scenario where we, we may have SSRF. Because what's happening in this function is it's taking in an encrypted URL decrypting that URL, and then basically proxying that request through the server. Um, so if we were able to provide some sort of encrypted URL, we could potentially proxy to any URL we wanted. But the big question was, how are we going to generate an encrypted URL? How does the encryption algorithm even work? Um, so that's when we started digging further and started reading into the source code and understanding how it worked. We found that this was the encryption function. It got the master key, and once it got the master key, it was able to encrypt a string. And you can see this logic of get master key, but essentially, uh, if the key version equals kv0, then it would return the default master key. Um, and in our scenario, uh, the key version was kv0, so it pretty much always returned the default master key. And the default master key was neatly just hard-coded in the source code. 
Um, so that was phenomenal. We were able to use this passphrase and salt data in order to generate an encrypted URL. But you know, sometimes, I, well, we didn't really want to recreate all of the encryption algorithms that they had written in C Sharp. So what we decided to do was to just hook in and rely on their own DLL files to encrypt our own strings. So we could leverage the functions they had already created in order to uh, encrypt our own strings. Um, this allowed us to specify arbitrary URLs to be encrypted, which then let us uh, proxy to any URL through blobhandler.ashx. So we had this uh, final exploit, which was just a Python script that you could run, and you could specify any host that you wanted to request, and it would generate this encrypted URL that you could use on AirWatch instances to access anything. The exploit write-up for this is uh, this link, but don't worry, the presentation will be available later. Um, I do have some final tips for source code review uh, that I want to go through before I close off this presentation. Um, for the novice code reviewers out there, my, the, the biggest takeaway you can have from this is identify your sources and sinks. The sources are where data is being input, and the sinks is where data is being processed ultimately. Spend time doing reconnaissance on the code base. For example, identifying all the routes through whatever mechanism that application framework has. Map these routes to server-side functionality and make a note of all the inputs for all these routes. Be thorough, it's worth it. And uh, go through the server-side flow from HTTP request, the source, uh, all the way down to the sync. And repeat this process for the rest of the attack surface. If you follow this, you will be successful with source code analysis. For the more experienced code reviewers, um, understand how things interoperate within the software and uh, really review the dependencies that are used within a project because sometimes you will find vulnerabilities within a dependency of a dependency and it could still affect the actual application. Don't make any assumptions, even for standard libraries. Read through the documentation thoroughly and understand how these standard functions work to make sure that they don't have flaws in them themselves. And ensure that you're covering all the attack surface. Often there's going to be other internal ports exposed, other internal services that you may be able to access in some creative way. So try and cover more attack surface as much as possible. Also, you can uh, start chaining vulnerabilities for impact. So if there's an SSRF, do not stop there. Try and find something more critical through that SSRF. And if you gain a deep understanding about, this about an application and its stack by reading documentation thoroughly, I cannot, yeah, I recommend you do that because I cannot stress how important this is. Each application and framework is different and it can have its quirks. That's all. Thanks very much for coming to my talk. Excellent. And we have some time for questions. Are there any questions from the room or from the signal angel? No. Or are you moving that slowly? It could happen as well. No? If there are no questions, you will... Oh, please move to the mic. The microphones are here, because otherwise the people on the stream will not be able to hear the question. So first of all, thank you for the talk. My question is, uh, while you do the uh, code auditing, how do you keep an overview? I mean, what kind of tools do you use? Um, so I take a lot of notes um, in Sublime Text, basically, while I'm doing the source code auditing. However, I also rely on a few other tools beyond just you know, manually auditing stuff. So there's a tool that I use quite a lot now called SEMGREP. Um, if you've heard of that before, mm -hmm. but yes. you can essentially run your own rule sets and write your own rule sets as well, so it's quite useful. Um, as I have been doing a lot more software code audits over time, I have been writing a lot of SEMGREP rules that I can now run on any enterprise web application source code uh, that I have. But I usually take notes in Sublime Text or something like that. Okay. Thanks. No worries. Yeah? Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, also, thank you for me. Um, how have your experiences been with uh, reporting these vulnerabilities to the parties involved? Uh, it's been a mixed experience. So for us, we have uh, our own disclosure policy, which is essentially uh, we will disclose the vulnerabilities after 90 days or 30 days after patch. However, we've had some vendors that are extremely responsive and fix it within a very short period of time, but other vendors that 
uh, get to the point where they threaten us and things like that uh, for finding the vulnerabilities. So it's been a mixed bag. Um, however, most of the time, it's not a bad experience. It's been pretty good. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes. So, um, just following up on her question, um, you had a subdomain. Can you please move closer to the mic? Yeah, you have a subdomain from Facebook, uh, yeah. which you hacked the enterprise software for. Do you then first disclose to the vendor and hope they don't patch it to report to Facebook, or do you uh, report to Facebook as well? Uh, so it depends. I mean, back then, uh, that was maybe like five, six years ago, I reported that one directly to Facebook, and they worked with the vendor. Uh, but uh, typically nowadays, what I do is I report to the vendor first, I wait until a patch is available, and then I report to bug bounty programs. The reason I do this is because many programs have a zero-day policy, and they will refuse to pay you money if it is a zero day. It does depend on the program though. Some programs are much more willing to take zero day reports, but there are other programs that aren't so keen. Okay, clear, thanks. Any other? No? Let's thank the speaker for, for this great talk. <laughs>